The Work of Christ Lesson 4 in our study of one God in three persons Christianity is a faith based on who Jesus is and what he did. In this lesson, we will consider the two most important works of Christ, namely, the death of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the core of the Gospel. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4. Paul, wanting to describe the very essence, the core of his Gospel, said this, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the Gospel I preached to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. According to Paul, these two works of Christ, his death and his resurrection, are the Gospel. They are the Gospel. They are at the very heart of the Christian message and are central to all Christian life and thought. So that leads us to a very simple outline of this lesson. We are going to study the death or crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. In Romans 4 verse 25, Paul said he, speaking of Christ, was delivered up because of our transgressions and he was raised because of our justification. This crucial verse shows that our salvation is secured by Christ's death and resurrection. These two works of Christ are central. They're central to the Gospel, they're central to the New Testament, and they should be central to the thought and life of every disciple of Christ. We begin with the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for our sins. Jesus Christ died in our place for our sins. We call this the atonement. The atonement is at the very core of Christ's work. To atone means to make amends for wrong. Jesus atoned for sin by offering his life as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for sin. It was the central aspect of his work, his primary reason for coming to earth. This is affirmed by many, many New Testament passages. Let's consider a few examples. In Mark 10 verse 45, the Lord himself says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. John the Baptist had earlier testified about Jesus. John, the writer of the Gospel, tells the account and he says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Of course, the vision of a Lamb of God portrays Jesus as a sacrificial Lamb who is going to offer his lifeblood as a ransom for the sins of the world, a sin offering, so to speak. In 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 and 6, the Apostle Paul writes, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men. Once again, we see Jesus offering his life portrayed as a ransom. And finally, for our purposes, in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 14 and 15, the Apostle Paul writes, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. The death of Christ meets our deepest needs. On the cross, Jesus secured the solution to all of our deepest needs as human beings. They may not be our most pressing felt needs, 
but they are our most permanent real needs. Let's consider three of these critical needs that are addressed at the cross. Need 1. We are under the wrath of God. Because of our sin and rebellion, our holy God is justifiably angry with us, and we can do nothing to change it. But, Jesus died as a propitiation. The word means that he bore the punishment for our sins and in doing so, appeased the wrath of God. Therefore, his death meets what is probably our greatest need of all, our need for forgiveness. Need 2. We are separated from God. Our sin causes a barrier between us and our Heavenly Father. And once again, we can do nothing to restore the peace. But, Jesus died as our reconciliation. In other words, He died to restore our relationship with God. Therefore, His death meets our need for friendship with God. Need 3. We're in bondage to sin. Yes, we are slaves to sin. And once again, we have no power to break its hold over us. But, Jesus died for our redemption. The word redemption has the idea of buying back something that has been lost, that has been lost into servitude or slavery. Through his death, Jesus redeemed us from the dominion of Satan and from the dominion of sin. Therefore, his death meets our need for freedom, freedom from bondage. So we see that in the cross, God provides the solution to all of our deepest problems. He provides a way of meeting our most permanent real needs. As you reflect on the glorious and gracious way that God, through the sacrifice of his one and only Son, has met our every need, it would be appropriate to take a moment to bow your head in prayer or to lift your hands in praise and give thanks to your Father. Second, we are going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus rose for our justification. The resurrection was at the very heart of the gospel that the early church preached. It was even more prominent in their preaching than the crucifixion, the death of Christ. In Acts 1, Judas has committed suicide, Jesus has ascended into heaven, and Peter, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, decides that they need to appoint a replacement for Judas. So in Acts 1 verse 22, this is what they agree. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. In other words, the primary criterion they identify for somebody to be a, an apostle in place of Judas, who had forsaken his place, is that that person had to be a witness of Jesus' resurrection. In other words, the resurrection was so central that being a witness of the resurrection was the primary criterion for selecting an apostle to replace Judas. Indeed, the resurrection was the central focus of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. He has a tiny excerpt from Acts 2 verse 32. Peter boldly declared that God raised this Jesus to life and we are witnesses of the fact. If we trace the sermons recorded in Acts, we quickly find that the resurrection of Jesus was the central theme in the preaching of the early church. For example, in Acts 3 verse 15 we read, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. Or in Acts 4 verse 2, they were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Or Acts 4 verse 10, Whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. And we could go on and on. If we were to 
go and draw out excerpts from the sermons that are recorded in the book of Acts, we would find that the resurrection was the most prominent theme of the early church's preaching. Now, why was that? Why is the resurrection so central to the message of the early church and so central to the message of the gospel? I want to offer three reasons. One, the resurrection served as a verification of deity, of Jesus' deity. Two, the resurrection is a vindication of deliverance. And three, the resurrection proves Jesus' victory over death and guarantees our final victory over death. First, the resurrection served as a verification of deity. This is reason number one. The resurrection is central to the gospel message because it serves as the verification of Jesus' deity. In a nutshell, the resurrection proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Jesus Christ claimed to be the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Those are some staggering claims, aren't they? The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be. You see, Christianity stands or falls on Jesus Christ. If Jesus is who he claimed to be, then Christianity is true. Jesus Christ stands or falls on the resurrection. If he rose from the dead, all his claims are true, and he is Lord of all and Savior of all. If he did not rise, all his claims are false, and he was either a liar or a lunatic. It's the resurrection that establishes that he is or isn't who he claimed to be. Paul realized that the resurrection was God's way of declaring in power that Jesus was the Son of God. He wrote this in Romans 1 verse 4. And through the Spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. God, by raising Jesus from the dead, showed powerfully that Jesus is the Son of God. In other words, he verified the almost outrageous claims that Jesus made to being God and Saviour. Secondly, the resurrection served as a vindication of deliverance. This is reason two. The resurrection is central to the gospel message because it serves as a vindication of the deliverance that Jesus secured. In other words, it proves that his saving work was successful and complete. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was the proof that God had accepted his death as a sufficient payment for sin. Romans 4 verse 25 is, is quite a key verse in our discussion of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Paul writes that he was delivered over to death for our sins and he was raised to life for our justification. We read this verse earlier in this lecture in a different translation. This is the NRV and, and there's some things we need to point out. The word translated for on two occasions here actually has the root meaning of on account of or because of. The idea in Romans 4.25 is that Jesus died because we are sinners and he rose because he had paid for our sins. In other words, his resurrection was possible because his death had accomplished its objective. He had atoned for sin, the work was done, and so he rose victoriously to vindicate the deliverance he had secured. Thirdly, the resurrection served as a victory over death. Reason number three this is. The resurrection is central to the gospel message because it serves as a victory over death. In other words, Christ's victory over death ensures our victory over death. 
He has conquered death, so we share in his victory. As a result, we have nothing to fear from death. We share in Christ's victory. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 22, Paul writes, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. As a result, we have no fear of death. We have nothing to fear from death. Paul said in another place, Where, O death, is your sting? Referring to the fact that Jesus' resurrection has taken the sting out of death. In Hebrews 2 verses 14 to 15, the inspired author says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Although the author of Hebrews is talking to the fact that Jesus' death secured our freedom, broke the stranglehold of the devil over us and secured our freedom from bondage, etc., it's his resurrection that serves as the seal on that, the guarantee that we don't need to fear dying, but we will spend eternity with Christ. We will be raised with Christ. Jesus' victory over death also has present significance for us. In Romans 8, 11, Paul writes, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. The resurrection power of Christ, that is the power of God which he used to raise Jesus from the dead, is already at work in us. This is part of the New Testament teaching. Death is intimately connected with Satan, sin, and sickness. In fact, it's the end product of their work. Since Christ has disarmed Satan and delivered us from his dominion, and since he is setting us free, not only from the pollution of sin, but also from the power of sin, his life-giving power is already at work within us. The death and resurrection of Jesus are the key to our freedom from the power of sin, of Satan, of sickness, and ultimately they liberate us from the fear of death. In conclusion then, the two key works of Jesus are his death and resurrection. Jesus Christ died in our place to pay the penalty for our sins. His death means that our need for forgiveness, for friendship and for freedom are provided by God. Jesus Christ also rose from the dead. He rose from the dead because he had atoned for our sins. His resurrection proved his deity, validated the atonement, and served as a victory over death.